On News 4 at 5, home invasion and assault. We have the latest on the investigation into what happened at LaShawn McCoy's Georgia home. Looking beautiful right through the finish of the work week, but we are tracking a chance for a few showers at the start of the weekend. We'll have the latest coming up. Plus, calling for change after a new arrest is made in an attempted kidnapping case. Lawmakers want to know how a sex offender went undetected. News 4 at 5 starts right now. Live in high definition, this is Western New York's news leader. Now, News 4 at 5. The female who was assaulted. Police in Georgia still investigating a home invasion at the home of Buffalo Bills running back LaShawn McCoy. Tonight, we're hearing how dispatchers put out those radio calls. Good evening, everyone. I'm Don Postles. And I'm Jackie Walker. McCoy's estranged girlfriend lived in that home. News Force Chris Hervatis has been looking into these latest developments. Chris? Well, Jackie, about 15 minutes ago, police in Milton, Georgia, sent me the police report associated with this case. We're just getting a look at it now. There are many redactions, but it does note that police are investigating a case of armed robbery and aggravated assault. We are also hearing those 911 dispatch calls made in the early morning hours of Tuesday. You will hear the dispatcher refer to a woman believed to be McCoy's estranged girlfriend. We do PD and Ralph in reference to a home invasion. The female who was assaulted hit in the head, locked in the bathroom. Now, the lawyer for McCoy's estranged girlfriend, Delisha Corden, says a male assailant hit Corden in the face multiple times with a gun. This police report I'm here does note that a handgun was used. She also says McCoy has been trying to evict Corden from his suburban Atlanta home and that the perp yesterday morning demanded jewelry that McCoy had given to Corden. Corden's attorney also alleges that McCoy had asked for that jewelry back and had suggested that Corden could be robbed because the jewelry was expensive. Today, McCoy was expected to return to Georgia. He says a social media post accusing him of assaulting Corden is, quote, baseless and offensive. He also says he hasn't had contact with the people involved in this case in months. Our calls to McCoy's lawyer from the high-profile Atlanta-based firm Garland, uh, Samuel, and Loeb were not returned today. Both the Bills and the league say they are looking into this matter. Chris Horvath, it's News 4 at 5. Thank you, Chris. We'll continue to follow this story and bring you any updates right here on air and on our News 4 app. She uh, was certainly the rock in our lives. Heart-wrenching moments in a state Supreme Court room this morning as we heard from the family of a UB nursing school assistant professor who was hit and killed on the thruway last summer. And the pain was also expressed by the Saratoga County man who was sentenced for her death today. News 4's Katie Alexander was in the courtroom. She brings us the latest now. 28-year-old Christopher Gregoric was facing up to 15 years in prison after pleading guilty to manslaughter. Instead, he'll spend the next one and a half to four and a half years behind bars for the 2017 crash that killed 44-year-old Ellen Volpe. Fair or not. You're the latest symbol of distracted driving. Prosecutors say Gregoric was using the internet on his phone while he was driving a box truck near the Depew exit of the thruway last June. The lanes narrowed in a construction site, and the DA says Gregoric didn't look up in time to see traffic nearly stopped. He smashed into the back of Volpe's car. It was awful, not only in the sense of the, of the damage that it caused to everyone involved here, but more, most importantly, it cost the life of this beautiful woman. Ellen Volpe was a well-loved assistant nursing professor at UB, driving to work from her home in Rochester. I am uh, happy that I get to see her face in my two young sons, John and Paul, each day. Um, and I miss my wife dearly. Volpe's sons were just two and three years old when she died. But I, like Ellen, dreamed of parenthood for so long that I am pierced to the core by being the person responsible for cutting that dream so short. I can't imagine what her children are going through, but I've seen a shadow of it in my own son's face. His mother and I had to sit down and explain that I may have to leave, and for longer than he thought. Gregoric's attorney asked for probation, but Volpe's husband asked for a jail sentence for Gregoric to think at length about what he had done. I wish from the bottom of my heart that I could go back 
and stop the death of Ellen Volpe from happening. Because I cannot change the past, I am determined to change the future. Gregoric told the court he's determined to share his story and to share the dangers of distracted driving with high schoolers and other groups, but he'll have to wait at least a year and a half, the minimum he'll serve, until he gets that chance. In Buffalo, Katie Alexander, News 4. An investigation is underway tonight after a Buffalo man was killed while unloading fencing from a tractor trailer. This happened on Eckerd Road in Eden. Police say the fencing shifted, pinning 29 year old Jason Okturski underneath it. Police say this happened at a private home and they wouldn't be any more specific. And we're working to learn if OSHA will be investigating. It's unacceptable. New York needs to step up and do something so we're on the same page. There are calls for change tonight after a convicted sex offender almost kidnapped a six-year-old girl in Wheatfield. And the wrong man was initially arrested and held for 12 days behind bars, but he has since been freed. A level three sex offender who was out on parole is now charged with that crime, and now local leaders are speaking out about problems with how sex offenders are tracked here in New York State. News 4's Marissa Perlman is here with more. Marissa? Don, the Niagara County Sheriff says Larry Kuiper was roaming Niagara County for almost a full week unmonitored. Kuiper was convicted of a sex crime with a teenager in 1983 and, as you mentioned, was out on parole. But Sheriff Jim Votor says they lost track of him when he cut off his ankle monitor. Yesterday, Votor says his department had no word from the State Department of Corrections that Kuiper was running loose in the county. Well, today, Votor tells us he says he did receive a brief flyer from the parole board about Kuiper last week, but tells us it didn't mention that missing ankle monitor. Votor says he's been fighting for years to get the parole division to use the same software system used by his department and police agencies statewide. Senator Patrick Gallivan, a former parole board member himself, agrees change is needed, but he says it will take more than a new software system. That never, especially for a dangerous individual, can or should take the place of human contact. Somebody picking up the telephone and saying, hey, there's a dangerous person that we are looking for. Can you help? Or you have reason to be concerned if that person is dangerous. That wouldn't be the routine. That might not be the drug offender. It might not be the burglar. But certainly a level three sex offender, I would think, rises to that issue. Now, we spoke with leaders from the State Parole Board today. We're told once they noticed Kuiper's monitor was off, his name was put into a national database, which all law enforcement has access to. They also tell us the Niagara Crime Analysis Center was notified, and they put out a B on the lookout for Kuiper. Marissa Perlman, News 4 at 5. And straight ahead in two minutes, the Buffalo Billion corruption case is now in the hands of the jury. We'll have a live report from Manhattan as we await a verdict. And coming up at 5.30, we have new information about the man shot and killed on the 190 this week and a person of interest in the case. We'll tell you how you can help in this investigation.